I think Mike said it very well, and that is that the advantage sort of arose out of, you know, almost a kind of uh, adversity for the dentists. The dentists were really scared that, uh, unnecessarily scared that the world was going to be taken over by, by, you know, us liberals, and that we were going to do something to them, and they were going to be out of business. And, and they were, their, their response to that was to try to be positive and to try to organize themselves in a way that took advantages of the efficiency of business, is doing things, um, you know, using resources carefully and trying to, to, to measure their outcomes, um, at the same time achieving the social goals. And, and you know, we're, we're very cognizant of the fact that, that your mission statement includes the goal that, that nobody has any pain, that, that nobody goes without. Um, and that's not the way, you know, they might say that in the, in the motto, you know, in the mission statement of the American Dental Association, but I assure you that that's not what their primary motive is. Their primary motive is take care of number one, okay? And, and taking care of number one, someone gets in the way. So you guys started out of that, you know, motivation, um, and, and you are a series of experiments. You're a series of, 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 of you know, evolving wasn't the master plan, except to survive. And, and, and there wasn't any a clear sort of scientific basis for how everything was being done. And, and so, you know, you as employees, one of the things you see, and some of you have been around a while, you see constant flux. You see Mike changed his mind all the time and, and you know, coming up with another idea. And poor Charity has to then figure out a way to implement yet another one of these crazy schemes. And, and um, that's the way the world really operates, okay? In the, in, in the best, you know, uh, in the best sense of it, um, that's, that's a good idea. But for those of us who are used to working in places and having jobs, you know, the idea that it keeps changing, that the rules keep changing, the expectations keep changing, you know, is, is unsettling. And, and um, we kind of understand that. A at the same time, um, you are faced with a really unique situation. And that is that all of us grew up in a system where going to the dentist meant that you, you basically did what the dentist told you to do. And the dentist told you to do a whole series of things. Come and have your teeth cleaned. Come every six months. Okay? So it might surprise you to know that there's absolutely no basis for that six-month recall. Okay? There's no science behind it at all. One of my colleagues wrote an article in, in the British journal Lancet, famous medical journal, where he, he questioned why that was being done. And he was nearly drummed out of the dental profession. Because what was he doing? He was getting it at the bottom line here, okay? He was getting at the way resources are being used, and, and the people who were benefiting by this constant recall of people who didn't have anything wrong with them, okay, got at somebody's pocketbook, right? And, but what it, what it really got at was that, that the clients, your clients, have certain kind of expectations. You have certain kind of expectations. When you go to the dentist yourself, you're trained. Okay? You're trained. And, and, and you don't ever say, well, you know, why are you making me do this? Like, like you know, we used to take x-rays every year, right? Now, of course, you know that the FDA guidelines don't allow that, right? But we still have dentists who want to take x-rays every year. Right? My wife goes to the dentist. She's never had a cavity in her life, and she and, and, and they want to take X-rays. Okay, and and so clients have expectations, and then you're on the telephone with them, right? So so you know why won't you clean my four-year-old's teeth? And you say, well, but that's not one of the things that we do, right? Okay, so you're in the middle, right? You're in the middle. So here they are trying to implement what comes down to a careful way to use scarce resources. Because if we don't use these resources that we have carefully, we can't take care of everybody who has need. Okay? And, and, and at the same time, we have everybody's expectations that, that it should be the old way. And you're caught in the middle. And we understand that. So we want to talk a little bit about um, that situation that you're in. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the clinical science and then uh, Dr. Huebner and Dr. Weinstein are going to talk about some aspects of this um, to give you some clues about, about you know, how you deal with your client's expectations, and how you square what's, what, what you're being asked to do and what, you, what the company's doing with 
um, you know, the, the world out there that isn't like you. Okay, not yet. Okay. But the world is changing, okay? And, and, you know, at a certain point, I don't know if you know the book, The Tipping Point, at a certain point, things change. In our society, things change. Right? I mean, I resisted for the longest time having a cell phone. Right? <laughs> Try to take it away from me. Right? <laughs> things change, right? At a certain point. This is what our field is changing. It's changing a lot. Now, the way that Advantage has made money traditionally, even though its mission statement says it's supposed to take care of everybody, is basically by not taking care of a lot of people. Okay? You can't make money on a capitation rate that isn't adequate to pay for conventional care if you do conventional care and you take care of everybody. So you do conventional care, because in the beginning, Advantage was doing basically conventional care. Okay? All the dentists out there all trained to do conventional care. They never trained to do any of this crazy stuff. Okay? So they did conventional care, and it wasn't enough money, so the way you made money as a business was you just didn't take care of a lot of people. That's what's gone on. The other managed care programs are doing that willy-nilly. They're perfectly happy with that model. They pretend that they're taking care of everybody because they'll go out and they'll do screenings or they'll do other things to up the numbers to make it look like they're taking care of everybody. But they're not because the tooth decay rates aren't going down. Okay, and the real bottom line is whether the tooth decay rates go down, whether the kids miss less school. Those are the real issues. Okay, that's why we're doing this. We're not doing this to make fillings. That's not the end point. That's not the goal. And, and so the flux that you're caught in now, and I really admire you guys to stick with this, okay, the flux you're caught in now is that you're taking this old model and you're saying, oh, wait a minute. You know, this is no good because it results in a whole lot of kids who are in need. Because who doesn't get care? You know, if we, if we say, well, okay, your average utilization rate's been 40%, if you want to be really honest, okay? If it's 40%, who's in the 60%? Well, in the 60% are basically, you know, you might say the lazy mothers, you know, the ones who don't care enough, the ones who are ignorant, right? That's who they are, right? If they call and they complain enough, you're gonna get them care. You guys are good at that, right? You'll take them right away. But if they don't call and they don't say anything and they, and they don't respond to your phone calls, you, they don't get care. That's the way it works. Okay, so we're turning this around and we're saying, well, no, no, no. Let's go out and find everybody who's really in need and let's do something about it. The problem with that is if you do what we've done conventionally, what I was taught to do, what he was taught to do, what all these guys were taught to do, if you do that, you will go bankrupt. And, and very short order. Very, very short order. Okay, so, so you're forced by, by having a mission statement that says you want to take care of everybody to change. And you're in the middle. You're interpreting the company's policies. You're interpreting what the dentists are doing. Okay, and that's what, the, that's what this is all about. So let me talk a little bit about some of the science, and then we'll talk about some, we're going to have some behavioral science, we're going to have quite a lot of behavioral science, a little child management, we throw in a lot of different kinds of things, and then eventually we want you to put iodine on each other and fluoride on each other because, because you should know what everybody's being asked to do and how simple and non-invasive it is. Okay, I don't really have to tell you this, but I'll just point out to you that the SMILE survey for Oregon shows that Oregon's oral health is getting worse. The children are getting worse. They're not getting better. Okay, so we're spending more and more money but actually, the results are actually poor. Okay, that's all you need to know. It's getting worse. So if you're a public health person like me, you don't want it to get worse, you want it to get better. So let's start out with the basics. We started filling teeth. We started doing the things that dentists know how to do. Before we understood what the nature of the problem was. And that's not unusual in medicine at all. Okay? It's really not unusual at all. We, we have lots of places in medicine where we do treatments because they seem to work empirically, but we don't exactly know why. And we don't understand exactly what the underlying phenomenon is. Now, it turns out, though, that tooth decay is caused by bacteria. Okay? And if you don't have the bacteria, you simply can't get the disease. And we've actually known that a very long time. But nobody really wanted to believe it. Nobody really wanted to buy into it. I mean, I, like, we've known 100 years, okay? 
And we've known really, really clearly for, you know, well, we've known for 100 years, easy. And, and basically what happens is that if you get these bacteria growing on your teeth and you let them grow in sufficient numbers, which is aided by having a very poor diet full of sugar, okay, various kinds of sugar, the bacteria will grow rapidly and they will outnumber all the other bacteria in your mouth, many of which are good actors, things you need. And these bacteria have this quality of being like a power plant. Okay? So what we do in a power plant, right, is we feed diesel, coal, whatever it is, into the power plant, right? And the power plant makes energy, right? That's why you need us to turn the lights on. It, turns, it keeps the air conditioning on. But one of the byproducts of power plants is what? Pollution. Pollution, acid rain, right? Kills the trees up in Sisters. So what is it that's coming out of the power plant? Well, two things, water and carbon dioxide. Turns out that carbon dioxide's an acid. Okay? Eats into stuff. So these bacteria that cause tooth decay, they're little power plants. Because their role in life is, you know, basically sex and and you know, making babies. Poop. Yeah, sex and pooping. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, so basically what these little power plants do is they take in sugar, that's their, that's their coal, that's their diesel, they take it in, they make energy because they cannot survive if they don't make energy, and they have very, very specialized power plant to do that. And what's the poop contain? Water. And what else? Lactic acid. Okay. So then you take and you put that lactic acid right there on the teeth. And you do that day after day after day. In fact, every time you eat, especially if you eat a diet with a lot of carbohydrates in it, you have all those bacteria. It turns out that they are very well adapted. They like that environment. They like living in acid. They like living where there's not much oxygen. Okay? So they like and, they have, and they've evolved to have sticky substances that keep them right next to the tooth, okay? like little suction cups. Okay? They like that place in the community, and they will fight to the death to stay in that place in the community. And, and, and then we feed them, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow, and every time they poop, they put out acid. Okay? You know how you get potholes? How do you get potholes in an asphalt street? Does the pothole start from the top, or does the pothole start from inside the road? Do you know? Hmm? Inside. Inside, right, okay. Because what happens is that the, the water and stuff goes through the, the, the part of the, the outside of the asphalt, goes underneath, undermines the road, and then one day it breaks down and you get a pothole, right? You just described what a cavity is, okay? So this acid permeates through the tooth, through the white part of the tooth, inside the inside, it, it, it damages the inside, eventually it falls in, you get a cavity. Okay? We have to stop that process. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that, but this is all starts with, a, with an infection. You don't get this infection, you don't get this disease. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about where that comes from. So this is the way we normally do things. I apologize to a couple of you who saw this earlier this morning.
Maybe you get the point. I don't care how many holes you drill. If the problem is bacterial, there'll be another one hiding behind another tooth. Okay? And that's the fallacy of, of the, the surgical approach to fixing teeth. Nothing wrong with fixing teeth. If they're broken, it's nice to have them restored. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm a dentist. I mean, I'm used to doing that, know how to do it. That, but that's not what the issue is. The issue is that if you have this persistent infection and, and people who you know, have such high levels of, of, of problems, you, you will never solve the problem of doing it that way. And, and you use up a lot of resources doing that. But again, you know, our, our clients really have the expectation that that's the solution. And you are, in a way, on the line to try to help people understand that that's not the nature of the, of the problem anymore. We can't do it that way. Okay. Back in the 1950s, you know, after the Second World War, when everybody sort of started to pay attention to these things and the country was becoming a little more affluent, everybody had tooth decay. I mean, it just it, there wasn't anybody who didn't have it. It was very unusual not to have it. And, and so you could have this approach where everybody, you know, you, you basically had a restorative approach, a surgical approach to everything, because it sort of fit with what the problem was, because the treatment that people got was fillings and extractions. There wasn't any prevention. I mean, they were like, it was like, like they were overwhelmed. But that isn't the nature of the problem anymore. The problem is that we have a whole lot of people who don't need any care, who basically are pretty healthy, and then we have a group of people who have a lot of problems and need much more intensive effort. And the solutions that we develop, you know, when we have different kind of problem, don't work very well right now. And they, and you know, it didn't matter to us in the 1950s whether everybody got care. So that wasn't one of the issues that was discussed. We didn't have Medicaid. We, didn't, we hadn't decided as a country that we were going to try to, to make a difference. Once having made that decision, we had to act differently. But for the longest time, we persisted in acting the way we always acted. Okay, we changed our goal, but we didn't change our methods. And so it turns out that goal, you know, we're not achieving the goal because we have methods that are sort of inappropriate. Okay, so why do we do it this way? We do it because it, we have concern for patients. We want to reduce suffering. Okay, and um, but we developed it without an understanding of, of what the problem was. So you take this kid with all that tooth decay and you put him in the hospital and you do the absolute best care, standard of care. Put him in the hospital, fix all their teeth, do all the little root canals, put all the little crowns on there, right? And in six months, 50% of them will have decay again. And you spent how many thousand dollars, right? So then, then you know, when you look at your, at your global budget for your company, 6% of the kids took... 75% of the money, I don't, know, I don't know exactly what the number is, but it's, it's a lot, okay? So basically you're saying, well, who were the 6%? Well, they were the kids that got there. They were the, at the front of the line. It wasn't you didn't, you didn't make a conscious decision to say, well, those are the worst kids or those are the most important kids. or what? It's just the kids who got at the front of the line. Okay? And that's not an acceptable solution today. And it doesn't work. Okay, because if you if there's any disease that has a 50% recurrence rate, okay, I'm going to put your kid in the hospital. I'm going to, I'm going to give him a general anesthetic. I'm going to inject him with all those risks, and I want you to know that the chances that this kid will be back here again are 50%. Who would sign up for that? We don't disclose that information. We don't tell people that. Okay, we don't want to admit that the treatment we're doing doesn't work. Okay. It simply doesn't work, but yet we've persisted in doing it. And you're in the midst of all this change, okay? But it's for understandable reasons. We want to eliminate suffering. If you take a kid with a bunch of abscesses and you do all this treatment on them, in the short term, they will be healthier. They will have less, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have, they won't have two things. I mean, it definitely has some short-term benefits. It just doesn't work in the long run. And it's a huge endeavor to do this. It's tying up, you know, in many hospitals, the anesthesiologists will refuse to do this because the dentists take up so much time in the operating room and they don't get reimbursed very well for doing this. So the physicians don't want to do this either. Okay? And I have a pediatric anesthesiologist who works for me. She, she keeps saying to me, she's got a public health degree, she's saying to me, why are you doing this? She doesn't understand it. And she's the putting them to sleep. The average cost in central range of hospitalization Yeah. 
certainly more than the cost of my first car. Uh, okay, so so the way we do, the way we look at this is we break it down into into critical periods, and I'll talk about each of these critical periods. Um, but basically, a perinatal period, and you know the company's got an incentive to get pregnant women into care, and and I'll explain to you the basis for that. Uh, little kids, because little kids, if you can get to them before their teeth have holes in them, just like if you can if you can maintain the roads without allowing the potholes to occur, it's cheaper, it's more effective, the kids um, have better outcomes. Okay. We put a lot of effort in our society into four and five year olds and head start kids. Um, my view is that much of that money is misspent and misplaced, um, that it's too late already for many of those kids, um, and that we ought to have started a lot earlier. We'll talk a little bit about that. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, school kids and some of the things that that um, we need to do to make sure that the kids' adult dentitions are, are healthy. Um, so we, I said the first critical period is this sort of perinatal period. And, and um, you don't need to understand a whole lot of science to, to, to get this. But the, the, the height of these bars, these are three different studies, Finland, uh, Sweden, and Japan. I was involved in this one. The height of the bar is is what proportion of children have a lot of tooth decay bacteria, okay? So if the bar is taller, the kids have a lot of tooth decay bacteria. And, and so basically, and these are the children of mothers who've received xylitol. In all three studies, the, the mothers, while they were um, either pregnant or when, during, when the child was like during their first year of life, they all got xylitol gum. The, the green the green kid the green mothers all the, these kids of the mothers who got salad, they're all green okay um, kids didn't get anything only the only the moms got it okay the yellow ones were were control group so the yellow ones basically got kind of the standard approach or nothing okay Russian food. and then and then they basically looked at what proportion of the kids got infected so you take a bunch of mothers they're all infected and the expectation is that a lot of their kids are going to get infected. If you put this xylitol gum in there, turns out less kids get infected. Does that, does that make sense to you? Okay. And the reason that the xylitol works is because the xylitol affects the bacteria. Okay. So in this, this is a follow-up to the to the Finnish study, and basically um, this is a measure of how much tooth decay the children got. So again, the mothers got treated. In in the in the Finnish study, the mothers got xylitol gum during the first two years of the child's life. So you know, you get all your baby teeth by the time you're 24 months old. So during the time when the kids were getting their baby teeth, the mother chewed gum. Okay? The, the, the conventional group basically got kind of standard stuff. All right? Kids were not touched. Nothing was done to the kids. No varnish, nothing. Okay? And this is how much tooth decay. So down here, the small amount of tooth decay, those are the kids whose mothers got xylitol gum. These kids, the mothers got the standard stuff. Remember, nothing was done to the kid. Simple strategy, but it basically takes advantage of the fact that we know this is caused by bacteria. Put something in that affects the bacteria, you get this kind of result. So it turns out, and this is why you're being asked to get pregnant women into dental care, okay? Is if you do some basic care, like take out hopeless teeth and, and fill the, the, the big holes, okay? Maybe treat the big holes with something like silver nitrate or, so, or, or silver fluoride. You can have the same result that you have with the xylitol. Same result. Okay. So when do you suppose this study was done? Right. Much just happened because we didn't know about it, right? Well, no, see, actually, this study was published in 1994, but the study was actually done quite a lot before that because these women have been, and children have been followed quite a long time. This is not new. We've known this for a long time. We haven't acted on the information that we know. We haven't changed the system, okay? That's, that tells you how long it, it takes to change an entrenched way of thinking. All of us are faced with that. And that's why it's no surprise when you talk to the clients or even you talk to some of your dentists that they say things that don't sound like the company policy, right? And they believe the things they're saying. They're sincere about the things they're saying. They're just wrong. Okay, we haven't changed yet. Okay, 
So, so when we started out on this on this path of uh, focusing on these uh, on the perinatal period, okay, we said we, we've got to do something about moms going to the dentist. And basically, what we found out was that the moms the, the moms who had Medicaid who were eligible for this care did not know most of them did not know they had, were eligible for dental care. And the second part of it was they didn't think they were welcome, right? And the truth was they weren't welcome, were they? Okay, dentist said, come back when you're not pregnant. Well, the only problem with that was you also won't have any Medicaid when, you come, when you're not pregnant, right? So we had this kind of mismatch with everybody, everybody not quite acting in concert, right? So we went around the state, and, we, and I did a lot of continuing medical education for physicians about oral health during pregnancy, that it was safe to get care. And Advantage distributed big posters with information that went out all over the state. Okay, so that people, the physicians would say to the dentist, it's safe to go ahead and treat this mother. Okay, we also did things like, like you know, centralized uh, appointment making, right? It wasn't very long ago that if you were a pregnant mom and you wanted to get dental care, you played, you played telephone roulette. Okay, you had no idea where you were going to get care from. So all the managed care plans now have all put in place ways so that moms can get Care. And they put in policies like you have to get them in in a couple weeks, okay? Because we know that that women on Medicaid generally get their coverage during their second trimester because they don't start prenatal care until their second trimester, okay? And they lose their coverage two months after the baby's born. And we know that as they move through their pregnancy, they become uncomfortable, right? And they don't want to get dental care. It's not a priority. And of course, who's going to go to the dentist a month after your child's born, right? And a lot of these women are single parents. I mean, you're not going to go to the dentist. It's just not going to be a really high priority. I mean, your priority is to try to figure out how to deal with the screaming infant, right, and change diapers. You're not getting any sleep. You're not going to go to the dentist. So this policy that you have in place to get these women in really early makes sense. So in Climate Falls, we, with uh, Marilyn Sutherland's health department, we did this little experiment. And we basically moved the rate of women who were um, going to the dentist from about 8 in 100 Medicaid women going to the dentist during pregnancy from about 8 in 100 up to almost 70%. Charity did that. What was she doing? She was doing case management, cajoling moms, staying on top of it, maybe, you know, helping be the conduit between the, between the women and the health department and the, and, the, uh, and the dental office. Not a really difficult concept. Remember, the women didn't think they had coverage and they didn't think they were welcome. And as soon as you change those two things, bam, they all went to the dentist. Okay. Again, we're doing this because we care about the kids. Okay. And the women do this because they care about their kids. That's one of the things Dr. Weinstein will, will, will remind you of, is that women will do things for their children. Even if they don't care about their own teeth, they will do them for their children. And we can take advantage of that. Okay. So this, this slide, I did fix the and, Colleen. Thank you for pointing that out to me. The kids who are going to get tooth decay, the babies are going to get tooth decay, have plaque on their teeth. Normal two-year-olds, normal one-year-old, do not have lots of plaque. They do not have, they have, sometimes have Oreo cookies, but they normally don't have huge big mats of bacteria growing on their teeth, except if they're going to get tooth decay. And the ones who are going to get tooth decay, they have big, big amounts of this plaque, this mat on their teeth, this biofilm, if you will, okay? And if you actually test these kids, if you, if you um, put a little slide in their mouth that, that um, captures the bacteria that are in their saliva, okay, or, or, or scrape it off their teeth and put it on there, and you put it in a medium that will grow that stuff, okay, the kids who are, um, are infected heavily, they, they, they look like this. You just, I mean, the colonies will grow up, put it in a nice warm place, and the colonies will just grow up, and you can see how many bacteria they have. Kids who don't have that, they look like this. They don't have very many of these bacteria. So you can actually test them if you want to. But a shorthand way is if they've got gunk all over their teeth, they're probably infected. And especially if they're low income and they come from moms who haven't had very good dental care, you have a pretty good bet. You don't need to know a heck of a lot. Okay? You really don't. So the idea here, though, the implication is maybe half the kids have moderate or high risk 
That is that they would, if you, if you were to grow their bacteria, you would see a lot of the bacteria growing. But the reverse is also true, okay? If 50% are, are moderate or high risk, 50% are low risk. So when we were in, in Primeville and we were in, in, in Hermiston and we were examining school children, low income school children, not all the kids have cavities, only some of them. And the kids who have them, the kids who are really high risk, they need to get intensive treatment. They need to get not just one fluoride treatment, they need a whole program of fluoride treatments. They need antimicrobials and things that I'm going to talk about. Okay? So the idea is, again, that you have a limited budget, you have limited resources, you have limited hygienist time or, or, or dentist time. You can't, if you give everybody something, you essentially run out of resources. The alternative is to say, well, wait a minute, I know something about this problem. I can pick out the kids who are the highest risk, and then I can do something more intensively, okay? And we need to change our thinking so that we, we approach that way. Now, the problem you face, because you're dealing with clients, is that means you're saying to somebody, well, no, actually, your child doesn't need that. But, but how come, you know, everybody else is getting this? This is what I was taught, you know, by my parents was the right thing to do. Are you discriminating against me? Right? Anybody ever heard that? Right? You just don't like poor people, right? Well, of course, in, in our history, there's been plenty of discrimination. But you guys aren't discriminating in the, in, the, in the negative sense. You're discriminating in the positive sense. Your child's actually healthy. You don't really need this. And it would be wasteful to give your child this. And, and Dr. Wentz is going to talk a little bit more about this, because I think this is, this is the crux of the problem that you face in being the communicators for, for many of the policies. But, but the point is, if you do things the way we've always done them, you will waste resources, and you as a company will go broke. Okay? Because the only alternative you have is to deny care. And I assure you, you can make a profit doing that because people have done it a long time. But it's not part of your mission statement. You'd be embarrassed. Okay. So is it unethical to use this approach? So there, there's the tooth fairy. I'm just saying, the more teeth you pull, the more money we both make. Okay. You get it? The tooth fairy talking to the dentist. That's kind of where we've been, right? It's unethical to keep doing what we've been doing. That's the truth. Okay. So we've been uh, out in... Um, in a bunch of counties out here, in, in Josephine, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Douglas counties, I got it right this time, uh, and as we had started out in Klamath Falls, and we've been out actually experimenting. We don't expect you to believe just because we say that these things work, but actually what we've been doing is we've been using um, motivational counseling techniques, both over the telephone and in person, using basically lay people to do these these. Uh, little sessions. And what we've been able to, to show is that by using the strategies that we, we have advocated that are really based in science, we can increase the number of moms who will take their kid to the dentist. Simple as that. And, and Dr. Weinstein and Dr. Hemer are going to talk a little bit about what's important about the message, how to, how to get on target. And you can help, because if you understand what those messages are, and you understand the way to say these things, then you can be part of the, the, the way that the company gets the message out, and you can make a difference for the kids. And I assure you that, that that's, that's what this is all about. OK, so we talked about the perinatal period. We talked about keeping mom healthy. We talked about preventing the kids from getting the infections. The kids, incidentally, get the infections by oral contact between mom and child. And, and, and you're not going to stop that. I mean, people have, have, have talked about silly things like, you know, not sharing spoons and, and, and other kinds of silly stuff. And, and that's not going to that's not going to happen. Okay. Um, we're going to we're going to have oral contact with our kids. We're going to kiss them and do all the things that, that, that are normal parenting kind of things. So so we have to do something more clever than, than talk about stuff like that. And, and um, it's really about controlling these infections. Um, kids will also get tooth decay from other kids at Head Start, places like that that we call horizontal transmission, but it's not the major way that it happens. Now you'll hear, um, incidentally, you'll hear some naysayers in, in Oregon say things like, well, what are you trying to do, sterilize all the, all the moms? I heard public health dentists say that. 
And, and you know, my view about that is that um, that's just, you know, silly talking, I mean, old-fashioned talking. We have the means, we've shown in repeated studies that we can do this, okay? I didn't say it was easy to do, okay? But we know how to do it. So the question is, can you organize your business? Can you organize the system so you can actually accomplish what you know is right? If you can't, you probably don't belong in the business, okay? The people who want to do it the old way, they're persisting. You know, eventually somebody's going to catch up with them and say, wait a minute, how come we've known all this stuff for all this time and you're not using it? Right? If you went to your physician and your physician offered you a treatment that was invented in 1940 and has been replaced by two other treatments, right? You would say, I'm not going to a different physician. This person's out of date. But we've persisted in dentistry in doing these things that are out of date and nobody's questioned them. Well, we're questioning them. Okay? We're expecting everybody to know how to do it differently. And you're on the leading edge of doing that. Okay, so now let's talk about these, these, these baby teeth. So kids get all their baby teeth by 24 months, right? They get the first tooth anywhere between six and nine months. As soon as they start getting those teeth, they, the teeth get colonized by the bad bacteria, if they're there, okay? And, and um, the, te the bacteria are probably there before the teeth are there. We used to say that there was this window when you could get infected and it had to do with, with tooth erosion. But we know now, because we can measure the bacteria more in a more sophisticated way, that the, that the bacteria truly are from mom. They have the, exactly the same genotype, as the, the you know, same genetic profile as the mom's bacteria, and that they're there early. They're, they're there before there are teeth. Okay? So that means that if we're going to make any difference, we better be there before there are teeth. We better be there when the first teeth are coming in. Okay? Because if we leave the teeth in there and we let the bacteria grow, we feed them a nice poverty diet, and they get at a convenience store, Full of, full, of, full of big gulp in, 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 in sippy cups, right? Or whatever it is that they're giving them. They're going to get, they have the infection and they're going to grow the bacteria. So the first thing is stop the infection. Okay, I'm talking a little bit about that. The, the second part of it is, is um, help repair the teeth. And that's what toothpaste does, and I'll talk about that. Um, and, and we believe, and, and I think the company believes, that some issues like free, free distribution of toothpaste is a good idea because the toothpaste is really quite effective. And we're talking about using uh, not just fluoride varnish, but fluoride varnish with an antiseptic iodine. Because again, it addresses some of these infection issues. And, and, then, and then finally, of course, a very focused message that we know that, that most people in society have not learned that baby teeth are really important. Because of course you get another set. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. We want the message to be really focused. Because if you think about your visit to the dentist uh, and, and you came away with a bag of goodies, and it usually had sticks and string and brushes and paste and, and God knows what else. <laughs> and you came away completely unsure about what it was you were supposed to do. And most of it went in the medicine chest and you never use it until it's expired and you throw it out. Okay? That's the reality. We don't have a clear message. We have too many messages, too confusing. Okay? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. All right. So, so. The, just like the row, just like the example I gave you, if you get this plaque growing on these teeth, you will get a spot under there. And the first decay is right there. It's the, it's the beginning of the pothole. It's brown, it's yellow, it changes colors, it gets opaque. It's the beginning of the bacteria pooping all over the tooth and starting to damage the inside. The reason the color changes is because the inside's changing. Because the tooth's kind of translucent, like quartz, right? You can kind of see through it. So what you're seeing is the change underneath. If you get this problem, and it can occur on the front teeth and the back teeth, between the teeth, it doesn't make any difference. It can occur next to orthodontic braces. If you, if you act to stop that when it's at this stage, you can reverse the process. And you don't have to end up with a pothole. Okay. So one way to do that is to give away free toothpaste. So these guys in England, what they did, they were very clever. All they did was they mailed out free toothpaste and some explanation to a whole bunch of low-income people who had five-year-olds. And lo and behold, the tooth decay rate went down. Okay? If you combine that with a home visitor, you send a nurse out. In England, they do this. They send out home visitors. We do this here for, for kids with special needs, right? We send out a visiting nurse. If you explain what the nature of the problem is and you give them free toothpaste, guess what? The rate of decay goes down. Can you think of a cheaper thing to do? Right? So toothpaste is really, really um, a great thing to use. Now, here's the, I, I talked about xylitol. Xylitol is a sugar, occurs naturally. You can get it in corn and raspberries, and 
Most of this alcohol we eat in the United States comes from the corn. Other countries it comes from the birch trees. But basically, it's a sugar. But it turns out that this sugar, um, the bacteria can't use it to make acid. It's, it gums up the, the, the acid-producing mechanism in the bacteria. So what we did, I did, was we made a syrup out of this stuff, and um, we gave it to these moms. These are very low-income moms. Average uh, per capita income in this particular place is $2,500 a year. $2,500, okay? These are very poor people. Typical breakfast for children in this, in this society is top ramen with Kool-Aid powder on it. Can you think of a better diet? Um, and, and so what we did was we got these moms to squeeze this little tube of, of xylitol on their kids time, uh, two or three times per day. And these kids normally would have, 50% of them would have caries by the time they were 24 months of age. And we prevented 50 to 70% of all the tooth decay with just using this. No fluoride, nothing, no toothbrushes, not a, nothing, okay? This stuff is extremely potent. Um, it's hard for us to do this because it requires frequent dosing and it's expensive. But the principle is really clear. You can take a very young kid and you can control the infection in that young kid and you, they won't get tooth decay, or at least a very large portion of them won't get it. And if you can do it in this kind of place, I assure you, you can do these things in a richer place. Um, so we use, now, so, so that's the antibacterial part of this. We also use fluoride. And fluoride's main role is a repair mechanism. Okay? And when the acid poop is on the teeth and it damages the teeth, the crystals can be repaired by putting fluoride on them. And the reason that toothpaste works is because toothpaste hangs around in the plaque on your teeth going on. But you have other things in your saliva like calcium and phosphorus and stuff, all of which all help repair your teeth and maintain the homeostasis, maintain the, 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 the integrity of your teeth. But when one of these things gets out of whack, like a whole lot of bacteria producing a whole lot of acid, okay, then your normal repair mechanisms don't work well enough. It's not that they don't work at all. They work, but they don't work sufficiently. Okay, well, the same thing, though, is true about this, these fluoride varnishes. We used to think, well, all we need to do is every six months we'll put the fluoride varnish on the teeth and, and, and we'll make it better, right? And indeed... You get about a 30% reduction. If you just put this fluoride varnish on there twice a year, you get about a 30% reduction in tooth decay. The problem is that if you have 10 cavities, you, you, know, you can do the math. You still have a lot of cavities, right? And these poor kids, they have a lot of cavities. So, so, so then we, we came around and we said, well, okay, the, the solution to this is let's do it three times a year, okay? Three times is a little bit better than two times, but not a whole lot better, okay? So Dr. Weinstein and I thought, well, okay, we're going to put it on. We're going to put it on really heavily. We're like, we'll do it, you know, for 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 three weeks. We're going to put it on every week, and and you know, we'll make this work better. The kids still get cavities. Okay, this stuff used that way is not that effective, even though we thought it was a really good thing when it first arrived. It turns out one of the critical issues, though, is that if you don't get it regularly. And in this particular case, this particular study, and this has been verified now by somebody else, that basically if you don't get at least four fluoride treatments between the time you are getting your teeth, like nine months, and when you get all your teeth, like 24, 30 months, okay, you don't get at least four treatments spaced out. You don't get any benefit at all. Okay, so when you're saying to mom, you know, you need to bring your kid back, okay, the reason you're saying that is because if you don't get these regular treatments, you don't get any benefit. Zero benefit. There's a threshold. Okay. Now, even if you do that, you still get cavities if you have this bad diet. Okay, so we have to add something to that. And what we add to that is iodine. Povidone iodine. Povidone is an inactive ingredient, uh, but it, it's a molecule of the iodine. The iodine is a little tiny molecule. And, and you couldn't use it very readily in the mouth. Um, so they attach it to a bigger thing to make it stick around a little bit longer. Um, and and it turns out that this stuff is dirt cheap and it's been known for a long time to preferentially um, stop the tooth decay bacteria. So, and it, it also kills some other good things like funguses and stuff that are probably actually um, things that we don't really need in our mouths. 
but it doesn't disrupt our normal uh, mouth bacteria. Not much, anyway. Okay. So it turns out that what we did, and, and again, I did this over in the islands where the tooth decay rates were really high, was uh, we first painted on some iodine, which doesn't sting, it doesn't taste bad, okay, it doesn't stain the teeth. And then we wiped off the excess and we painted the teeth with fluoride varnish. And lo and behold, we had about a 31% improvement in the tooth decay prevention by adding the antiseptic. Again, you think about it, it's a bacterial infection. If you treat the bacteria, well, maybe you can have an effect on the infection. Same time, you have the benefits of the fluoride helping, again, to remineralize and repair the teeth. Because, because none of these things are perfect, okay? So the combination works better than one <coughs> or the other alone. And with very little in the way of side effects, and very cheap. So I just show you here, so here's one of our kitties. You know, typical knee-to-knee -knee position like we teach people to do. Um, you can notice that the you know, mom is there uh, maintaining control over the hands and arms, right? Um, these children are usually singing to us, saying some you know, really nice song. <laughs> usually a single note. <laughs> it varies in intensity depending upon the, how much practice the child has had. Um, but we'll basically wipe the teeth off with gauze and paint on a little iodine. The amount of iodine you need is the amount that would saturate a tiny little cotton ball. Not the kind you use for your makeup, but for like a little tiny cotton ball like dentists use. You don't need very much, okay? And you can paint that on. And if you use that much, the little tiny amount, you don't even need to wipe it off. But if you use this much, like one of these things from the hospital, you wipe off the excess, okay? Wipe off the excess. You can see that the singing is continued. <laughs> and then you put the fluoride varnish on. Okay? And you give a kid a hug. And you're done. Okay? You added, you know, two cents to the cost and you um, if that much and you um, and you did a, a really good thing for controlling the bacteria. Okay. Don't forget the hug. Okay. So that's the basic approach. And and if any any of you know someone who's got cancer? Anybody know anyone's got cancer? Everybody, okay? Right. So what they do in cancer therapy, cancer drugs are nasty drugs, right? They have a lot of side effects. Everybody knows that. They have a lot of side effects. So what they figured out, and, and they're not perfect, okay? They don't work perfectly. And 100% of people who get the cancer drugs don't get better, right? What they figured out was that if they used two cancer drugs instead of one, Well, I was fine. That worked great. Let's put all our resources into the four and five year olds. Except that's old old news, right? We know better now. We know when this starts. We know what the factors are, and we know that if we intervene early, we can make a difference. We can make it so the kids don't end up like this. Okay? So we can't keep doing this if we need the resources to do the other. And that's the bottom line. So, so how, what's a better way to use our resources? Well, we start out with those basics again, okay? The first thing is that if everybody's not brushing their teeth, we're not accomplishing anything. Colleen's going to talk a little bit about toothbrushing a little bit, so I won't get into it. But basically, you know, we got we to gotta use what we know. And toothbrushing really works. Okay, Florida toothpaste works. Okay, we, you know now that you can control this infection. Well, why do we want to control the infection when the kids already have holes in their teeth? Well, it turns out that the infection there in the mouth, on the teeth, will still be there when the permanent teeth are there, right? Unless something changes. So, you know, we have the opportunity here, even if the kids got, you know, snuck through and got tooth decay, we still have the opportunity to try to stop the infection, all right? So we want to use these kind of approaches. And it turns out that even among, even among, let's say, Head Start kids or kids that are, you know, four and five years old, they will continue to get a little more tooth decay, maybe a lot more tooth decay. And, and what we're trying to prevent there is those kids ending up at about six or seven years old in somebody's office or in the emergency department with an abscess. We have the opportunity to stop that. We can change that now. Every dentist knows that they, they've seen kids, they, dentists call it burnout, arrested tooth decay, stopped tooth decay. The kids got it when they were really young, their diet changed, maybe they got off the bottle, whatever it was, the kids got a little bit older, and the tooth decay is there, the teeth are broken, and it's all stopped. Okay, 
That's our goal. Get it to stop. Because if it stops, then the, then, the, then the permanent teeth are going to be protected. And that's really what we want. When those permanent teeth do erupt into an environment which is healthier. That should be our goal. Okay? And so why do we use things like silver nitrate or silver, silver fluoride? Okay? Same reason. Okay? These are combined treatments, antimicrobial, anti antiseptic kind of treatments, and fluoride treatments together. Okay? They're just a different mechanism for delivering the same basic approach. If you put silver fluoride in the teeth, what happens? They turn dark, right? Put silver nitrate, they turn dark. Okay, that's exactly the same thing that happens if you take a kid that's been on a baby bottle and got a whole bunch of tooth decay, and you take away the baby bottle and you give them a healthy diet, their teeth turn dark. It's a natural phenomenon. Okay? All we're doing is doing the same thing nature does, okay? except that we're using a, a treatment to, to accomplish the same thing. Thinking about it very differently than, oh, they're, they're trying to do a cheap treatment on my kids and, and, and make them all dark, right, just because they're poor. Okay. That's not what they, this is a natural phenomenon. This is not an artificial phenomenon, okay? All we're doing is speeding it up, okay? Make it happen. Anybody got a grandma who lives in a, in a nursing home who has, has tooth decay and doesn't have any money to get them fixed or who's too frail to get it fixed? Well, that grandma can be treated with exactly the same strategy, okay? Because what's grandma eating in most, she's got, probably not got very good teeth, and she's eating a bunch of soft foods, and usually with a lot of, a lot of uh, sugar in them and stuff. You know, they're trying to bulk her up, make sure she gets enough calories, and, you know, or you've got, a, you've got a recovering cancer patient. What are they giving them? They're giving them those nutritional supplements that taste like chalk and chocolate, right? And, and full of sugar, right? What are they doing? They're feeding all this bacteria. So you're gonna, you know, you're gonna take one of those people and you know put them into a full mouth reconstruction. Well, you could do that, okay. But a better strategy is do what nature does, which is to arrest the tooth decay, change some of the circumstances, and that's that's what the rationale is here for this aged child. Okay, let the teeth exfoliate normally. Let the baby teeth be shed normally. Let the tooth fairy get them on a normal schedule. Okay, but let's not accelerate that by spending all our money and all our resources on these things, okay? I mean, pulling out all these baby teeth, you can do it, right? You can charge a lot of money if you're a dentist and you make a, a ton of dough, okay? But, but it, it doesn't fit with your mission statement, okay? Um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about silver fluoride and silver nitrate for a second. Um, you're probably tired of hearing about this a little bit, but, but you know that Advantage has, um, has uh, worked with us at the University of Washington to try to get um, this material, silver, diamine silver fluoride, approved by the FDA. And, and we're lucky this year, Mike and I will go to heaven and we'll get it approved. Um, we're close, we're close, but I've been optimistic for the last five years and so I, or longer. I have to tell you, you know, where this conversation came from was Mike and I were sitting down, in, I think in Klamath Falls, and he said, damn it, Peter, isn't there something else we can do? And I, and I, and, uh, yeah, right, you know, but isn't there something else we can do? And, and, you know, I'm not used to people asking me that kind of question, business people asking me that kind of question, because, because what surprised me was I said, well, you can do this stuff. I'm smuggling it in from Japan, and it works, and there's actually quite a lot of literature that shows that it works. Um, but, you know, you'd have to get it approved by the FDA. Mike said, Okay. <laughs> he didn't know what he was getting himself into or how much it was going to end up costing. But nevertheless, the idea was, it, it comes from this, you know, can't we, if we're going to follow our business model, if we're going to be true to our mission statement, you know, what techniques do we need? What materials do we need? And this turned out to be one of them. And, and so talk a little bit about this first, and then, and then I'll talk a little about the, the, the placeholder we have in silver nitrate. Um, but basically, we've known that silver fluoride did this sort of thing for about 300 years at least. 300 years, okay. Not yesterday. It, this stuff's been approved in Japan for more than 80 years, okay. And I assure you, Japan has very high standards for drug approval. In fact, fluoride varnish has never been approved for the reason that we use it here in the United States in Japan, because they're worried about fluoride. So, I mean, they're conservative. Um, but it's been approved. 
and it's used for tooth decay. And there's a bunch of studies that all show the same thing, and that is that you can arrest tooth decay with this stuff. What, what was very unusual was that, and I, I, I learned about this because I was the scientific reviewer for the journal that the Japanese researchers wanted, or they actually turned out to be Chinese researchers, wanted, they wanted to publish their article about the effect of this on preschoolers. They took all these preschoolers that had a whole bunch of half moon holes in their teeth, and they treated them all with silver fluoride, and they, the control group got fluoride varnish, and lo and behold, you know, the silver fluoride was twice or three times as effective, okay? And they wanted to submit this article to a journal, and I was the reviewer for the journal. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your only thing you're telling me about is the teeth that have holes in them. What about the rest of the teeth? You know, these are, these are human beings. Let's not just focus on the teeth. You know, it's dental people, right? So it turned out that when you place some of this liquid silver fluoride on a decayed tooth, you protect all the other teeth. It serves as a reservoir. Okay, you kill all the bacteria there. You're not just killing the ones right in that place where you put it. So it turns out that these kids actually had their future tooth decay uh, reduced by 50%. So the thing that, that interested me was not that you could stop the tooth decay because I already knew that, okay? I knew you could stop the tooth decay because we had taken the baby bottles away from kids and had the tooth decay stop. That was not the unique thing. The unique thing was that it protected the other teeth and it did a better job than the things we had. And the reason it worked was because it was a combination of the antibacterial, the antiseptic approach and the fluoride. So it was a different way of thinking about it. Again, combined treatments tend to be better than one treatment by itself. Okay, and it turns out, if you do this once, you can basically stop the tooth decay, but if you repeat it, it's even better. And it's compatible with certain kinds of white tooth fillings, like glass ionomers, the kinds of tooth fillings that were often used in children. Okay? It's not compatible with plastic fillings but it is compatible with these glass ionomers. So you can combine them, and you can have, if you have a cosmetic situation that you need to deal with, you can do both things. It's not, not incompatible. Okay. And again, it's cheap. So I just threw this in here. I bet you get a kick out of it. We interrupt this program for a special bulletin from the FDA. Whatever you've got in your mouth, spit it out. That's how we sometimes feel about the FDA. <laughs> but they're our friends. Okay. So what about silver nitrate? So, so the, just before I leave the silver, silver fluoride, silver fluoride is clear liquid, okay? Clear liquid, looks like water, smells just slightly like ammonia, very, very, but doesn't taste bad, doesn't sting, doesn't really cause any problems, okay? And you paint it on with a, with a little brush, okay? You just have to be careful to keep it off kids' faces and off of, off of your white coat, because it'll damage it. But, or off the linoleum and the countertops and other kinds of places <laughs> like that because it's stuff, it's mean stuff. But, but um, it's perfectly safe. And I've studied the safety of this stuff. I know that it's safe, okay. Um, so what about silver nitrate? Well, silver nitrate's been around a long time. It was probably in the Surgeon General's catalog in the time of the Civil War, at least. It's been used for eye problems in a variety of different places in medicine. Um, and its first dental uses were back in the 1800s. Um, the, the, Basically, the silver reacts with, with the organic material in the dentin, and it forms this protective layer. And you can see that we, that was back in 1937 they were talking about that. Nothing's new. And, and back in 1973, there was a study that basically showed that it arrested um, tooth decay. You take, take it, you put it on it, existing tooth decay, paint the stuff on again, it's water, looks like water, paint it on, stops the tooth decay. Same, you know, basic rationale, it's antimicrobial. Um, and, oops, sorry, I lost, lost my picture. That's okay. Um, and and I, I didn't bring it here, but what I could show you is that it, if you compare uh, silver nitrate application over a 12-month period, um, you know, with, with any other treatment, you basically can arrest the caries. If you just do one treatment and you let it go for a lot longer, you're not going to get that benefit. I mean, then it's not going to work so well. But if you repeat those treatments during those 12-month periods, um, you can basically arrest tooth decay. Now, is this better or worse than silver fluoride? The answer is I don't know, because the studies have never been done. 
The reason that we've been focusing on sulfur fluoride and getting it approved by the FDA is because there's a very, very large body of very credible scientific information out there that the public and our medical colleagues and the FDA and everybody will believe. If we went down the route of, of, of trying to show that tooth decay was stopped by silver nitrate, we would be up against the fact that the studies don't exist. And doing the studies costs millions and millions of dollars. Okay, Anything new that you go out there and you try to do is going to cost. The, the application fee at the FDA to get a drug approved is a million dollars. Okay, And that's before they evaluate clinical trials. So if they require clinical trials, you add a million for every clinical trial that they're evaluating, okay? There's a big barrier to getting this done, okay? So, so um, you know, we've tried to take an approach which basically is based on what we already know that, that gives us our strongest case for going forward. That's why we believe we're going to be successful ultimately. Um, Mike, did you want to say something? It was used alone. Yeah, just silver nitrate alone um, arrests these things. It's not clear to me, and of course Dr. Duffin's sitting here, he's the one that's been you know, doing so much of this. Uh, it's not clear to me whether the fluoride varnish adds anything or not, and nobody knows that. I mean, it's not hurting anything, but it, but we don't know whether it really is helping. I mean, it's just studies don't exist. And, and again, I mean, somebody could propose to do that, but I think you would have a very hard time getting any money to do that, and, and you might have trouble even getting approvals from ethics committees and so on to actually do these things today. So, you know, to the extent that we can base our work on what's already been done, um, we're, at, we're in a stronger position, I think, um, you know, from a regulatory point of view. And we're certainly in a stronger position in terms of convincing people, because I, if we had the time, I could show you point by point these studies. These are really fine studies that meet very high quality standards, today's high quality standards, the standards that the FDA expects. So we're in a much stronger position um, than, than using the stuff that was done in the 1930s, which is not going to be accepted by the FDA today. But the standards have gotten so much stricter. So let me blow your mind a little bit more, okay? So those of you who have been involved in processing claims, you know that, the, what, that what our pediatric dentist colleagues want to do is they want to put the kid in the hospital and they want to do a pulpotomy and a stainless steel crown. And it turns out that if you have a, a situation like this where, the, where the, um, you've got tooth decay in the dentin of the tooth, you know, it's invaded, um, and, and uh, the treatment for that, especially if, it's, if it involves more than one surface, is, is to make this steel cap, right? And since the kids are squirrely, we put a lot of the kids who need squirrel caps, uh, steel caps in the hospital, and then we end up spending all that money, okay? So Dr. Hall, who lives in Scotland, said, well, maybe we don't need to do it that way. Okay, Phil and I, we take care of squirrely kids. Okay, that's that's our specialty. You know, we take care of people that nobody else wants to take care of. Scaredy cats and mentally ill people and autistic kids and you know those kind of that's so so we're accustomed to the squirrely kid thing and we don't believe in papoose boards and tying kids down and all that because we think it has bad consequences and we don't think any of you would want your child to have that treatment. Okay, so the alternative was to put them in the hospital and that costs a lot of money. Okay, and then they get sick again in six months, right? So so that just doesn't seem to quite compute. Okay. So what Dr. Hall said, she saw that. Okay, She saw none of her colleagues would treat the squirrely kids and they wouldn't do what was the standard of care, these steel crowns. Uh, they just wouldn't do that. So, so what she said was, what if we took and, and we just created some space between the teeth by putting a little, a little uh, plastic separator between the teeth. Just made some space because the teeth will move. Okay. What if we did that and then we took and we cemented a steel crown on the tooth with with glass atom or cement, the same kind of cement we normally use, but without ever giving the kid an injection and without ever picking up a drill. Remember, decay in, inside the tooth, the kind that the, all dentists would agree needs to be filled. What if we just cemented this cap right over the top of this? And what do you think happened? Kids went on and they shed their teeth normally. Didn't cause a lot of abscesses. Didn't basically decay stop. Okay. And she, what she knew was that we already knew that. Okay, that's not new. Okay, that isn't new. We knew that. Okay, but we weren't using it because we were really focused on doing things in a certain kind of way. 
So, so these are called hall crowns. The, the reason we can do it on kids is because, any of you ever had a high filling? Anybody had a high filling? It drives you crazy, right? And if it's too high, of course, you break the filling. In kids, think about what your kid looks like when they're getting, they're losing their baby teeth and starting to get their permanent teeth. They look like this jungle in there, right? You know, you wonder how can they possibly eat? With the, you know, but it turns out kids adjust. So you put these things in there, and you don't have to worry about the bite. Basically, the kids adjust. So we can get away with this. And I can tell you, uh, you know, I just remember this one kid. I mean, he, his father's squirrely, his mother's weird, and, and the kid is really squirrely, okay? <laughs> and he's big. He's big, and you're not going to hold him down. And, and, and I had mom put the little separators in. You know, you just tie the dental floss around both sides, and you stretch them out, and you just force it between the teeth, okay? So mom did that for me. And I told the kid, basically, look, I'm going to have you bite down, not on my finger. I'm going to have you bite down, and, and it's going to taste a little salty, and we'll be done in about two minutes. And he said, okay. And he did it. Mom couldn't believe it. No screaming, no crying, no shots, nothing. Okay? Different way of approaching the problem. This way works. And in the worst case, a kid gets an abscess. Because you can always take the tooth out, or you can always do the endo treatment, you know, the little pulp treatment, through the crown. Okay? That's not a problem. Good dentists know how to do that. So, so it's not doing anything bad. It's just doing something different. Okay? And, and if you ask parents, we know what the kids would say, but if you ask parents, what would you prefer? The papoose board and, the, and being tied down and getting a shot and the kids screaming and me doing this versus doing this? Who's going to vote for the standard way? Okay? If the standard way were, were bad, I wouldn't advocate it. But the science basically shows that it works. Okay? But these things are being adopted outside the U.S. before the U.S. The U.S. has kind of been fixed in a certain way of doing things. You guys are on the edge. Okay? And so expect criticism. Expect people to ask questions because you're on the edge. You're doing something different. That's the way things work in life. Do something different. People, people, especially people who are who are vested in the way the system works, like the other managed care companies. Okay, they're going to criticize you. That's what always happens when change occurs. Buck up. Okay. So the final thing I want to talk about here is um, is, is school kids for a second, and then I'll be just about done, I think. Um, and that is that, that with school kids, again, our goal is to protect those permanent teeth, is to get the kids um, you know, through the beginning of elementary school without an abscess, or if they get an abscess in their baby teeth, to get it taken care of right away. Okay? The number of kids in elementary school in the first and second grade who get an abscess is really small. It might be one or two percent, in a, even in a poor school. Okay? So we can go through and we can identify those kids, we can do some screening, we can find them, we, you know, it doesn't take very many dentists or very much skill to get those teeth out of there. That's what's going to happen to them anyway. And, and no kid should go to school in pain. Right? But beyond that, we need to go and we start to implement the same kind of strategies I've been talking about. Create a healthy environment for the, for the permanent teeth to erupt into. Now, since my colleagues are going to talk a little bit about more about those things, I'm not going to. So I want to just try to blow your mind a little bit more. So you know that one of, the, one of the, um, the metrics that the state uses to evaluate advantage is how many sealants you put on, and the proportion of children you put sealants on. Okay. Now you know now, from what I told you, that 50% of the kids don't need them, do they? Because they aren't going to get any tooth decay. And the nice thing about the permanent teeth is that we have a way of telling which ones are at high risk, right? What's the way of telling? No, the baby teeth. If they had a whole bunch of tooth decay in the baby teeth, those permanent teeth are probably vulnerable. If they manage to get all the way through their baby teeth and they don't have anything wrong with them, and that's a lot of the kids, what are you putting things on their permanent teeth for? You're wasting money. You're doing it to kids who don't need it. Kids who don't have the bacteria, who don't have that environment, they will not get tooth decay. It's not possible. It doesn't come out of the air. It's an infection, okay? Now, you can take a kid and you can change their diet, okay? Because some of these bacteria will be there and you can change their diet and you can make them into susceptible kids. Fine. But that's not most kids. 
And you don't want to plan your program based on the assumption that somebody mean, evil is out there feeding the kids something bad all of a sudden so that they can make a problem for advantage. Okay. Sealants were not, this is going to blow your mind, sealants were not invented to prevent tooth decay. Did he say that? Sealants were not invented to prevent tooth decay. Sealants were invented to stop tooth decay. It turns out, because well, all sealants are fillings, okay? The material is just filling material. <laughs> the only difference is that, that, that you don't drill. But basically, you go in and you, and you, you condition the surface, you etch the surface, and you, and you polymerize this plastic into the little small indentations you create with the acid. Okay, it's just a filling. What it was really invented for was to put over tooth decay, early tooth decay. Because it turns out that most of the tooth decay in those molars happens when the teeth are first coming in. Okay? But most of the sealants are done like when kids are seven or eight, right? Because the sealants are technique sensitive. That is, that they have to be put on in a dry environment. And it's really hard to put them on when the teeth aren't fully erupted. So we adopted this idea that we'd wait until the kids were seven or eight, and then we put these plastic fillings on the teeth. And, and the idea was we were somehow preventing it. Well, but it turns out, when we did that, we didn't know how tooth decay formed in the permanent teeth. Uh, you don't believe me, do you? We actually didn't know, okay? And we used to think the tooth decay in the tops of teeth was different than the tooth decay in the sides of teeth, okay? And we used to say that the, that the decay was at the bottom of a, of a groove and your toothbrush bristle couldn't go in the bottom of the groove, right? So you needed to do something different. Well, it turns out it's not in the bottom of the groove, it's in the sides of the groove, just like it is on the sides of the teeth, okay? And it turns out that fluoride works on it. You put silver fluoride on it, for example, or silver nitrate, it works. Okay. But the problem in American dentistry was that if the dentist thinks that there's tooth decay in the tooth, they won't put the sealant on it. They, they won't do what the thing was intended for. They think they need to put a filling in there. They call it a preventive resin. They got a whole bunch of fancy names, right? All the same thing. It's fillings by another name, okay? And, and, but in fact, what it was intended for was exactly that situation. Because it turns out that we're not very good at figuring out whether there's decay there or not. Now, we can get machines that buzz and, and, and things that, you know, needles that go back and forth. Most of that stuff is crap. It doesn't work. It's a waste of money, okay? Just sold, okay? It buzzes. I don't know if you've ever been to a dentist that had one of those machines, but it goes beep, 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 and all of a sudden they say, your child needs a filling. Okay? But that would be exactly the place to put the sealant. But dentists in the United States won't do that. Okay? So they perverted what this stuff was for to the point now where what we're doing is we're just assuming that all the kids are all at the equal risk, and we're putting these things on when these teeth erupt if we don't see any decay. If we see any decay, then we want to put a filling in. Okay? So again, we're not using our resources very smart. The kids who are at risk, they need sealants, okay? Or they need silver nitrate or some other thing on those <coughs> surfaces to stop the decay. But only the kids who are at risk, and not all the kids. <coughs> so it also turns out, okay, so, so here's, here's basically um, this kind of situation where you have a, um, where you have a little bit of, of decay starting. And, or you have actually have a lot of decay and it's underneath and you can't see it. So, so you can take this tube with its decay in it and you can put a sealant in it and stop the decay. And back in the 80s, <laughs> 1980, there were studies that showed that. Okay. They're extremely impressive. And they followed these kids for a long time and they basically sealed these things up. They never reached for a drill. They just sealed them up and they stopped them. Or you can make a little hole, a small hole, not go and grind inside the tooth, but basically just create a little bit of a, what we call an undercut, right, just to create a little space, and take that glass ionomer cement that you know about and put it in there, right over all the gooey decay, and then put a sealant over the tooth and stop, be finished. Okay, because the problem is that when you get real aggressive, like most of the dentists in the room learn, you damage teeth. You damage them a lot. Now, you be support, you, most of you don't know this, but, but the, the way the dentists made cavities, the way they drill on teeth has been changing over the last few decades. 
It used to be that dentists made big holes. And the consequence of that was that pieces of tooth broke off later. And some of you are old enough to have gone to the dentist. The dentist says, well, your filling's fine, but a piece of your tooth broke off. And that's caused by those big holes. But it also turns out if you take a kid, I don't know if I brought a picture of this. I'm trying to see. It's, it's probably hard for you to see. But, but basically, if you, if you have decay starting in the top of a tooth and you do the conventional treatment, a lot of the kids will need root canals when you're done. Okay, because the nerves and blood vessels inside the tooth are really close to the surface when, when the teeth are immature. And it also turns out that if, 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 even assuming that the child's parents could afford to get a root canal or you Medicaid would cover it, that, that root canals in baby teeth don't work very well, or in permanent teeth that are young don't work very well. So you take these six and eight year olds and then you subject them to this root canal treatment at a big expense, a lot of them fail. Now we've been developing new methods to do this that don't work fail as much, but a lot of them do fail. And it's very expensive, okay? And the teeth are really badly compromised and if they don't get crowns on them eventually, they bust. So this isn't a terribly great treatment. So the alternative is you do this very, very minimal intervention either just sealing them up really, really well, you have to do a good job, um, or you make a tiny little hole and, and, and a place to do a kind filling, and then seal the top of the tooth, and that's the end of it. Okay, and these kids have been stopped, and I, I'm sorry you can't really see this well enough, but, but this was one of those kind of approaches with, a, with and they follow these kids you know, for like 10 years, and they don't find any ill effects of doing this. But we've had a hard time adopting these new strategies, okay? We're, 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 we're stuck. Yes, sir? What if you, uh, with a subsidiary uh, carrier, what if you put the silver fluoride or silver nitrate in there first and then seal with antibacterial and seal it because You can do that. You can do that if you use glass ionomer or you use, um, you, know, you can't use it with composite because right. uh, uh, they're not compi compatible with composites. You can do it with amalgam, for sure. And everybody, everybody who's seen somebody treated in, in, from uh, Eastern Europe will often see, you know, uh, black teeth under an amalgam or something. That's usually silver nitrate that was used. So, yeah, again, I think that's exactly right. Um, okay, that's what I wanted to say. Now we've, we've you know, I, I think what I was trying to accomplish is to get you to understand some of the technical reasons that, that we can change the way that we're doing things. Now what I'd like to do is to switch gears, and, and Dr. Weinstein's going to talk about some of the communications issues around this, because we recognize that you're caught in the middle of all of this. And, and then Dr. Heber's going to talk about toothpaste, and then eventually we're going to talk a little bit about some child management issues um, about squirrely kids. Okay, yes, sir. How much have you noticed a change in uh, the genetically modified foods and without their on toothbrushes? Don't know. Don't, don't know, and I don't know, know if anybody knows. I mean, what, what is very clear is that, that you know, all the so many of these corn-based products um, that are coming out now have a lot of sugar in them, a lot of sugar and salt. A lot of manufactured foods have that, and certainly those things are really not good for your health for a lot of reasons. Okay, let's see. Weinstein. Yes. Yes, sir. There you go, sir. Yes, you might have the time.